today's topic, we're going to discuss um, about liturgy. And more importantly, we're going to discuss about sacraments and why are sacraments a part of the Christian life? And why is it so imperative that we understand and live with these sacraments until the day we die? So, um, yeah, so we'll, defi we'll divide this, uh, this session into two parts. The first is going to be about liturgy, and the second will be about sacraments. And at the end, we have a special friend uh, who's willing to share with us her experience when she went through um, baptism uh, last year through RCI preparation, basically. Her hey. name is Devita, and she's calling in from Paris, France. So thank you so much, Dev, hey. for uh, for and helping us out yeah so stay uh stay till the end for that well usually you guys usually you guys stay until the end please, so it's fine <laughs> um yeah and then quick questions and answers as usual will follow after okay so we are going to discuss about the liturgy section first right and this part here where we call the celebration of the christian mystery Anybody knows uh, which church is in that photo? Ada detail nggak di sini? Kayaknya detail harusnya tahu deh. Ada detail tuh. <laughs> Dead the pressure dead. <laughs> It's Are okay. You, what was the question? Do you know uh, which church is in that photo over there? Because oh, this is actually an original. Oh, apa namanya? Pejongkongan. Yes, GKR. Yeah. Yeah. This is in GKR, guys. <laughs> this was where CFJ actually first started to uh, serve their English ministry. But yeah. Okay, so celebration of Christian mystery. Um, we celebrate Christ's death and resurrection here on earth, right? Especially when we've already proclaimed and went through the whole creed, we understand already that the mystery of Christ is revealed to us in this, in this whole history of mankind. And the order of revelations has been so wisely prepared and, and shown by Christ himself, especially when he came down here on earth. And you often hear these words, especially in mass, in, in uh, well, yeah, in mass, not just Sunday mass, because mass is every day. Uh, dying, he destroyed our death. Rising, he restored our life. He here meaning Christ. And as St. Augustine likes to put it, for it was from the side of Christ as he slept the sleep of death upon the cross that there came forth the wondrous sacrament of the whole church. So liturgy is a celebration of this mystery of Christ. In dying, he destroyed our death. In rising, he restored our life. And in liturgy, not only are we celebrating but we're also pro pro proclaiming uh, the good news. We're bearing witness mm. to it, to the whole entire world. Yes, yeah, sorry. Did I See? hear? Um, yeah? Hello? Tadi aja, Lexi. I don't know. It's just me yes. or everyone? I don't know. Uh, can everyone uh, like put in the chat if I'm lagging? So that we're aware, and I cannot see. The, okay, more chat too. Okay, then excuse me. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay, all right. So yeah, that's what liturgy is all about. These are the table of contents as usual, um, and so we'll discuss about what is the sacrament first, and then what is liturgy. Yeah. Just very quickly, uh, what is a sacrament? Tadi, we already watched the beautiful videos that were um, prepared and documented by the Ministry of Word on Fire by Bishop Aaron. But to put it simply, the sacraments are, are the encounters between men and God here on earth. They're the visible encounters, okay? Because the church was made manifest to the world on the day of Pentecost, right? By the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it is through the apostolic ordination and succession that this teachings, this grace, keeps on getting passed on from one generation to another. Sacrament. A sacrament is a place or, an, I, wouldn't, I don't like to call it a place, to be honest, because 
it doesn't have to be within the church. Sometimes like when you go to retreats, spiritual ones, and you, the priest comes as well, you can actually ask for a confession, a uh, sacrament of penance to him as well, which is why I would say that the sacrament is more of like an encounter with Christ himself. So there is something called the sacramental dispensation. The spirit dispenses Christ's ministry into the church's hands. That is what it means by a sacramental dispensation, which is why the church itself is the sacrament of salvation and grace, because it is through the church that Christ will continue to manifest, make present, and communicate his works of salvation and love to his, to his people, to his children, which aka us. Sacraments are perceptible signs, meaning they're visible. You can see them. You can touch. I mean, yeah. I mean, you encounter them. So in a way, they're, they're visible. And most importantly, sacraments bring us closer to God. It is a place where we can encounter and form a more intimate relationship with him. In total, there are seven sacraments in the Catholic Church. Okay, As, as we're going to discuss today, um, the first three are actually called sacraments of initiation. Now, sacraments of initiation includes baptism, Eucharist and confirmation, right? And then we have sacraments of healing, penance or confession or reconciliation. Ito namanya kaya interchangeable, those three terms. And we have anointing of the sick. And then we have the sacrament of holy orders and marriage, which is more of like a book towards vocational sacraments. So that's why it's divided into like that. But in total, there are seven sacraments. Now, what are the elements about a sacrament? So just to remind you, uh, when we talk about Paschal mystery, the definition of Paschal mystery is basically Jesus Christ's passion, crucifixion, death, burial, descent into hell, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, right? So it is what we all, what we celebrate in these sacraments as well. Most importantly, the first element of a sacrament is faith. It is a sacrament of faith, and the per because that because the purpose of the sacrament is to sanctify, is to sanctify us, is to build up the body of Christ, to build up each and every one of us to become this body of Christ that we've we've already touched upon, right? And of course, the purpose is also to give worship to God. They not only presuppose faith; sacraments do not only require your faith in order for them to be effective. Okay, but by words and objects, they also nourish, strengthen, and express it. Now, sacraments of salvation. Salvation is another element here when we talk about sacraments because sacraments confer something or give you something that we know as sacramental grace. Sacramental grace is the grace of the Holy Spirit that is given by Christ himself through each sacrament. So each sacrament has their own specific functions, you know, specific sacramental grace. We will talk about baptism and confirmation punya sacramental graces later. Bang, sacrament of mat uh, matrimony, marriage. Obviously, the, the sacramental grace is the bond of marriage, the bond of matrimony, right? And it's different. It's different from holy order. It's different from anointing of the sick and so on. But I like this quote here that's taken from the CCC. Uh, As fire transforms into itself everything it touches, so the Holy Spirit transforms into the divine life whatever is subjected to his power. The Holy Spirit is at work through the sacraments and in the sacraments, okay? Which is why act ex opere operato in Latin, which means by the very fact of the actions being performed. From the moment that a sacrament is celebrated and in accordance with the church's intention, it is the power of Christ, it is his spirit that acts in and through it. And that's independent, independent from the personal holiness of the minister. Because remember, they're just the means, the real power lies still with the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, however, when it comes to the fruits of sacraments, fruits of sacraments, ito buah. Jadi, after, sac after you receive the sacrament, what do you do with it, right? 
it depends on our own inner dispositions when we receive them, what we want to do with it. Okay, I hope that that's uh, clear because um, it's, it's maybe kaya for some of you who just are, especially the RA candidates, the word sacraments is still like kind of like blur, blur gitu. But this is part two. Until we're done with part two, uh, you will definitely get a better whole picture understanding of what sacraments is, is all about. So the last element is about eternal life. In the sacraments of Christ, the church already receives the guarantee of her inheritance and even now shares an everlasting life. In Titus 2, verse 13, a while awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of great God, of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. It is through the sacraments that we commemorate, that we put into memory Christ's passion and love. Right? So, which is why sacraments, um, next slide here, a quote from CCC, the fruit of sacramental life is both personal and ecclesial. And I highlighted and bolded that in red what does it mean it means that after receiving the sacraments you are not only personally impacted you are not only personally transformed or changed you have the christian responsibility to also make sure that those fruits that you bear in your life after receiving the sacramental graces should also be spread around to other people right that and hence building up the whole body of the church for every one of the faithful and, and the one hand, sorry, this fruit is life for God in Christ Jesus. For the church on the other is an increase in charity in her mission of witness. So which is why sacramental life is the fruits of it are both personal. You grow, you grow through the sacraments, but it's also ecclesial. We grow together as one family in God. So that is what sacraments are all about. Okay, now what is liturgy? The word liturgy originally means uh, public work or public service, which is, uh, which is actually still kind of what, I mean, the, the, the definition, the, the meaning itself, the word itself kind of like translates to its definition, right? Uh, in Christian tradition, it means the participation of God's people in his work. Liturgy makes the church present and manifests her as the visible sign of the communion in Christ between God and men especially in the sacrament of Eucharist, which we will talk about later. It is in liturgy whereby we, all of us, participate in the work of God. You, know, you listen to the message of truth, you listen to the readings in Mass, right, in the liturgy of the Word, and then it is also in that moment whereby you, every one of us, as one family in Christ, we celebrate uh, the Paschal Mystery. I like this uh, quote as well in the left side from the Sacramentum Concilium 10, paragraph number 10. The liturgy is the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed. It is also the font, front, I missed the R, from which all her power flows. Okay, so liturgy is very important in our Catholic faith. It is our main worship. It is, it is where there is that visible presence of the communion between us and God and us with each other. The Paschal mystery of Christ, by contrast, cannot only remain in the past, because by his death he destroyed death, and all that Christ is, all that he did and suffered for all men, participates in the divine eternity, and so transcends all times while being made present in them all. What does this mean? Such a long sentence. Trust me, the CCC has a way of like making really long sentences. Uh, to break it down, this Pascal mystery is a gift, right? It's a gift for all of us. And this gift is given throughout eternity. He is the Alpha and the Omega. His mysteries will transcend and be present across time, space, and throughout all generations of mankind. It is in liturgy that we celebrate this together, which is why by now, hopefully, um, you understand when we talk about mystery, we usually refer it to as Christ's life here, uh, Christ's mystery, the Paschal mystery. But liturgy actually has its Jewish origins as well, because interestingly, the Jews, both Jews and Christians, 
they it's an essential part whereby in their in their celebration they would proclaim the word of god using the bible okay but of course as you know we've talked about this before in sacred scripture session that the bibles that we use and what they use are, are different um nonetheless the tradition remains the same because remember that jesus himself was a devout jew so a lot of the things that he did uh, when it you know the means and the methods that he used to teach his apostles that his apostles succeeded throughout time through the lineage of succession is still being used up until now they also pray for intercession remember general intercessions if you attend sunday mass there is this one point one point uh right after when you say when you finish the creed you will uh start with general intercessions general intercessions is we pray for the living we pray for we pray for the, uh, the poor, the burdened, the suffering, right? We pray for world peace and so on. And then we also pray for the dead, which is why we have something called mass intentions. Now, for those of you who did not know, you can actually submit mass intentions at the beginning of mass. Okay, um, for, the, for the methods, you can ask Hardy or Dipio who's here, because like they're, they're the ones handling it more. Um, so if you want to pray for someone who just passed away, when you, when you want to pray for someone who is sick, you can actually include these mass intentions. And the mass intentions will be prayed within the church altogether, within the, within the liturgical celebration. So there's something called the liturgy of the word. The liturgy of the word usually starts, um, if you remember, we've talked about this in our previous session and the cheat sheet on mass is still available in the google drive please download it if you're interested to know more liturgy of the word itu are the readings first reading second reading right um and also of course the gospel it actually originates in jewish prayer it's, it originates in jewish tradition as well and then we have something called the liturgy of hours liturgy of hours are um, basically they're a set of prayers that marks the hours of each day all right, people do it yeah, per hour of, uh, of every day. And it consists primarily of psalms um, supplemented by hymns or readings, other prayers, and, and so on. Okay. I won't go much in details about that because, uh, yeah, we are, we're limited on time. But if you're interested to know more about it, you can ask us later. And of course, we have the Eucharistic prayer, which is the central, the pinnacle of the liturgical celebration that will be touched upon next week. More importantly, there is the Holy, Holy Spirit's role in liturgy. The Holy Spirit gives us spiritual understanding, spiritual understanding to understand, not only to hear the word of God, but also for us to understand according to the dispositions of our hearts. It puts us in a living relationship with Christ, it is also um, eliciting us for a response of faith, which is not only our consent to receive those teachings into our hearts, but also a commitment to enliven it in our lives, in our daily lives. And of course, the Holy Spirit is sent in order to bring us into communion with Christ and so to form his body, the church. So there is this Greek word, called anamnesis. Anamnesis means reminiscence or re memorial sacrifice. It's based on Luke 22 verse 19 when Jesus said, do this in memory of me. So in the liturgy of the word, the Holy Spirit recalls to the assembly all that Christ has done for us. In keeping with the nature of liturgical actions and the ritual traditions of the churches, the celebration makes a remembrance of the marvelous works of God. And that's what anamnesis is all about. It's about the memorial sacrifice of, of Christ, right? And then we have something called the epiclesis. These are all sections uh, in the whole mass that you can find. Again, you can actually find it in the cheat sheet. So if you guys haven't downloaded it, downloading it would be very helpful. It's on the Google Drive. It's called the Catholic Mass Cheat Sheet by Marmon because <laughs> we used it for Bible before. So the epiclesis uh, is a Greek word as well, which means calling down upon. Calling down upon who? The Holy Spirit. It's the same thing with anamnesis as well. Memorial sacrifice. The memorial sacrifice or the reminiscing 
is done through the Holy Spirit's through the Holy Spirit's presence in liturgy. You know, without the Holy Spirit, there's there's no such thing. Uh, for epiclesis, it's uh, it's when when there is um, when the priest begs the Father to send down the Holy Spirit as the sanctifier to to uh, sanctify the offerings, right? The offerings that we make to be unified with Christ's offerings. And then the second is, of course, um, for us to become the living offering to God as well. Because remember, um, I don't know if we've touched upon this. It's during liturgy, during mass, we are actually invited to put down our sacrifices in the form of, of a lot of things, of time, our attention, or all that we are basically. And we unite our sacrifices to God with Christ's sacrifice. Why? Because our sacrifice are still imperfect. They're blemished by sin, right? Nobody's perfect. We're all still sinners. But when Christ is unified, Christ's sacrifice is unified with us. Now that becomes the perfect sacrifice because Christ is the only perfect, unblemished sacrificial lamb. Okay. So the anamnesis and epiclesis are both the hearts of each sacramental celebration, most especially in the Eucharist. Again, we'll talk about the Eucharist in the next session. So don't be too uh, confused about it yet. <laughs> this is a bit of a snippet, I guess, for the Eucharist. St. John of Damascen said that you ask how the bread becomes the body of Christ and the wine, the blood of Christ. I shall tell you, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and accomplishes what surpasses every word and thought. Let it be enough for you to understand that it is by the Holy Spirit, just as it was of the Holy Virgin and by the Holy Spirit that the Lord through and in himself took flesh. Remember that Jesus' incarnation into this world is the Holy Spirit who works. So if that is made possible, if that is accomplished, then the Eucharist, the body, of Christ becoming the, of the bread becoming the body of Christ the wine becoming the blood of Christ is very much accomplished and possible so the next question uh 2.3 is who celebrates the liturgy right well the, the liturgy is actually an action of the whole of the whole of the whole Christ or of the whole church um we believe especially from the book of revelations which is the last book in the bible written by saint john it is revealed to us that liturgy is also celebrated. As we, as we celebrate Mass here on earth, we're actually celebrating it with them in heaven. You know, with the angels and saints, as we gather and acclaim, holy, holy, you heard of that, those sentences before? That's actually proclaimed in, uh, when we attend Mass. So you see each word in Mass, in liturgy, is actually very specific and bible oriented or, or bible founded okay because it is in revelations 4 verse 8 it is mentioned each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around even under day and night they never stopped saying holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come if you read the book of revelations you will see a lot of similarities between mass and the descriptions that are mentioned in the book of revelations but yeah so the liturgy is an eternal liturgy that the spirit and the church enables us to participate whenever we celebrate the mystery of salvation in the sacraments it is in the earthly liturgy that we can have foretaste of that heavenly liturgy which is celebrated in the holy city of Jerusalem, toward, toward which we journey as pilgrims, where Christ is sent, basically to where we, right now we're on a pilgrimage, we're on a pilgrimage to heaven, right? Our real homes, hopefully. <laughs> Amen. Pray for For me um but yeah so liturgy gives you the next one uh, oh sorry no we're still in who celebrates the liturgy 
So the liturgical service is not meant to be a private function. It's about celebrating the church's unity as well. So it's a sacrament of unity. Yes, it's a place for you to recollect and pray personally as well, but it's also a place where by all of us are gathered together as one family and you know um we we participate together in this liturgical service which is why i show you that picture there um that's actually cfj like years and years and years ago <laughs> i think it was the first or second no it's the second batch of leaders back then and uh, rich to hold hands together of course, right now, because of COVID-19, it is not recommended. So please don't go on doing it. Even after churches are open, they probably will not allow you to do it. Um, but yeah, instead of holding hands, why don't like hold each other's hearts, you know, in unison. Remember when they're like super bored, super tired, trust me, I have my moments as well. And Let's, let's just pray for each other to fight against it, okay? Because this liturgy is all about a celebration of our unity as one family and one children in Christ. So how is liturgy celebrated? There's a lot of signs and symbols um, that, you can, that you can see visibly, right? And um, there's a lot of singing and music as well, which is why we have the choir picture there. Put, I placed the choir picture over there and like what St. Augustine says, he who sings pray twice. If you guys haven't listened to our CFG choir, check out our YouTube. They're really amazing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so when we sing together, you know, especially when we sing the ordinariums together, ordinariums are the set of, of prayers that are turned into music. <laughs> I'm trying to like break it down really simply here. Yeah. And we sing it every time we have mass for instance our father our father who art in this you see like we sing that together right and itu pasti dinyanyiin setiap misa or like holy 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 lord so those are ordinariums and then we have holy images as well we have the cross usually at the very front of the church right it helps us it helps us because christian iconography they call it it does not only um, it's not only a statue there doing nothing. It's supposed to, again, punting or uh, elicit our response to faith. You know, it makes it, it makes it more visibly real that we are in the presence of God and our focus, our undivided attention is very much needed during that time. So uh, holy images are also very important. And then afterwards, we also have um, the other signs or symbols that we have when we make the sign of the cross. We're remembering our Trinitarian love, right? In the name of Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Those are signs and symbols that we do since way back before, since like the church was founded. And we still continue to do it because we are, part again, we are participating in this all together and the eternal liturgy that Christ constituted on this earth. So this is the liturgy of the word, as I mentioned a bit just now, liturgy of the word kind of focuses or emphasizes on the book of the word, AKA the lectionary, the first reading, the second reading, and of course the gospels. Right? Gospel is actually uh, very important, which is why we, we stand up when it's, the turn of the gospel, because in that moment, it is really Christ who is speaking to us through the gospels, right? The word of God. And then, um, yeah, these are all, all things that you can read in your own time, uh, the two, three, four, five, six. But what's most important is that your, the liturgy, the, the readings, the lectionaries that are chosen, usually um, when there's a, there's, there's always a common theme, you know, and for you to actually figure this out, you need to pay attention to the homily. The first reading maybe comes from the Old Testament and the second reading comes from the New Testament. Remember how we used to say that the old prepares for the new and the new illuminates the old or completes the old. And then we have the gospel. And finally, everything is put together and wrapped in a pretty ribbon in homily. It's during homily when the priest tries to explain the theme that overarches these readings. So, which is why it's very important to pay attention to the homily. If you are actually, um, you know, during mass, sometimes we struggle 
people to pay attention, especially if you have kids already and sometimes like making them keep quiet and sit still, it's hard. Bible Fellowship actually does, uh, they discuss the weekly mass meetings for Sunday. So if you're interested in that as usual, just check it out. Yeah, you know where Bible Fellowship is already by now, I'm sure. Or if you don't, then just uh, let us know in the chat box. So when is the liturgy celebrated? So this is what we call the liturgical calendar, all right? It is basically us sitting with the mother church in the cycles of her heart. That's very nice, isn't it? That's a very nice term that I learned from the, from the CI Institute uh, that Katrina works in. It is, the liturgical cycle is where we sit with mother church in the cycles of her heart. So we start with the first Sunday of Advent. And we start the first Sunday of Advent there, and then we move on to Christmas. Then we'll have ordinary time, and then in preparation going towards Lent, the Tridom, and then Easter, and ordinary time again. But it is also in these ordinary time we celebrate the Feast of Saints, or just like last, no, not last, two days ago, we celebrated, yesterday or two days ago, sorry, please check again. Um, or somebody can correct me. I believe that it was two days ago that, that no, it was yesterday, St. John the Baptist being a birthday, right? The solemnity. I actually forgot. <laughs> so if you, uh, it's people like that. Remember, we talk about how we celebrate the saints as if like we're celebrating our family member's birthday. Yeah, so it's, it's similar to that. And um, can I have the poll, Hardy? and see if people are actually paying attention or knows. So how many liturgi liturgical cycles are there? Okay. Oh, kurang error di situ. It's different than the liturgical seasons that you see in the, in the diagram, yeah? So liturgical cycle itu beda, and Hardy will explain <laughs> what it is. Thank you, Patsy. Yes, it was yesterday. Oh, Stephanie yes. Tanadi tadi guess Christus Raja Pejompongan. <laughs> okay, how many are um, have responded? And 61%. then we will see the results if people get it we're talking about the lectionary cycles here yeah not the liturgical season the liturgical seasons is that round diagram you see you know when we enter advent it's near christmas when we enter the the uh lenten period it's already near easter and the tridom and the easter and so forth we're talking about lectionary cycles hmm. Uh, we're at 66%. Hardy, is everyone, um, is uh, everyone 75 submitted? And it's almost a tie between three and four. I'll end this. Did I lose Hardy? I feel like I lost Hardy. Hello? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is supposed to be his part. Okay. okay. I don't know where Hardy is, so we'll just okay. move on. Oh, okay. There you go. Thank you, Yuli. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. So most people answer. No, most people answer four. Four. <laughs> Actually, only three. By the way, is the connection stable still with my voice? Um, if it's not, can you guys uh, put it in the chat so that I'm also aware? Is it me who's lagging or is it Hardy who's lagging? Well, I got put to see Adam. Slightly lagging. Okay, sorry. Cause like I am um, the internet today seems a bit 
that in my apartment here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Jackie. Right. Thank you. Uh, I will check on that. So is it is it three? Is it four? Okay. Or is it two? So um. Okay, but I cannot see about liturgical cycles. B, are you there? Yep, yep. Or Hello. else, like, I would have to do it. Hello. Okay, cut me if you. So you guys can hear me, but not Cynthia. Yes, no? Okay, cool. Um, if you, if you're, if you're finally, so there's a total of uh, three things. Years are designated as A, B, and C. Now, each of these yearly cycle, they begin on the first Sunday of Advent. Year A focuses on the Gospel of Matthew, and that is actually where we're at right now. Advent 2019 throughout 2020, our current year, okay? And then we have um, the Gospel of Mark, which will again start in Advent 2020 all the way up to 2021. Year C focuses on the Gospel of Luke, and that's like from Advent 2021 to 2022. Okay. So, we, you know, we talked, I think Hardy ever mentioned regarding how if you actually follow, you can hear, I can hear you both. Yeah, I can't hear Hardy. I don't know why. Sorry. Uh, okay, let me quit. Let me uh, remove myself to the and see. Okay. Oh. So where was she? Um, I'll just continue on from her. Year A, which is this year, is based on Matthew. Year B, next year is based on Mark with a little bit of John, while C is based on Luke. So that's three Gospels, but we have four. What happened to the fourth? John. John is usually reserved for Easter. Um, he is just there. So if you know reading one and then reading two and then Gospel, reading one, is based on the Old Testament, which is linked towards gospel. So whatever you read on, on reading one, the first reading, there'll be correlations that will lead towards the gospel. So for example, this coming Sunday is, is from Two Kings. It's The topic is about rewarding. And the gospel, as you can guess, is also about rewarding. While reading two, um, is based upon New Testament, but focuses on epistles. Epistles itu uh, uh, letters, letters uh, from communities, uh, from early churches communities. Jadi kayak, uh, and it will go, it will go in sequence. Jadi uh, if you if you listen from last week, it will follow following week, and then again, and then again. And then we also have uh, our weekdays. We have weekdays one. It's for odd years. Two is for even years. That simple. Um, the gospel is basically the same. It follows, okay, it follows, uh, Gospel of Mark, and then Gospel of Matthew, and then Gospel of Luke. John, again, goes reserved for Easter. Um, so yeah, um, but what happened to Advent, what happened to Christmas, what happened to Lent, it's basically um, whatever is appropriate to be talked about during that period of time. And for the weekdays readings, the first reading will always um, sort of like a, a continuous flow. Jadi, whatever is read from the previous day, it will continue again today, and then it will continue again tomorrow. More or less like that. So yeah, something like that.
that is cycles. Sin, yours. Thank you, Hardy. <laughs> ya nih, sorry, internet gue tadi jelek. <laughs> But yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so moving on uh, to the next slide. Where is the liturgy celebrated? Well, it's celebrated in the church, in the spiritual house of God. And visible churches, they are not simply gathering places, but they also signify and make uh, present, visibly present, that Christ is dwelling in this place. It is the home of Christ himself. Or it's also known as the house of prayer, right? Where, the, where we celebrate together the Eucharist, where we celebrate together liturgy, where we come to pray. And so, which is why this house ought to be in good taste and a worthy place of, for prayer and sacred ceremonial, meaning that it has to be, uh, it has to be appropriate. Okay. <laughs> I think my web, WhatsApp belum gue matiin lagi. <laughs> But okay, for that, uh, so we have this um, layout that's typically in, in the church. Okay, you have the baptistry in the front there. That's where you take the holy water and you make the sign of the cross and then you go in, right? And then usually there's seats, pews, pews, pews. And then you have Mother Mary statue, you have St. Joseph statue, You have uh, usually, sorry, Stations of the Cross that I missed there. Stations of the Cross are like the wooden planks usually. Kayak wooden, wooden planks gitu yang uh, gambarannya is when Jesus was, was carrying the cross or condemned with Pilate and so on. Um, it's basically telling the story of Jesus' Paschal mystery and has to be there. This is, the, this is the basic layout of what a church looks like, okay? And of course, at the very center of it all is the altar and tabernacle. Now, within the altar itself, there's different objects that you can find in it. Okay, this is interesting, I'm sure. Uh, you can see it in your own time as well. And um, there's actually one there, which is the ciborium. That's where you keep uh, the Eucharist. That's where mereka pakai untuk bagi in hosti, right? So the Eucharist ministers also have uh, hold something similar to that. So all those Those things just now, they're similar to what we call as the tabernacle and high priest that actually existed since the Exodus times, the book of Exodus. So, that's, and so this is why, again, we're so founded based on tradition, whereby lamb stands, you know, um, golden symbols, incense, they're, they've been used since 2000 years ago, okay? Since, uh, sorry, no, even more than 2000 years ago, because the book of Exodus is before Christ. So if you want to read up about it, it's in Exodus chapter 28. And it will describe you in details about the uh, priest's garments as well, like what they're supposed to wear. These are the roots of our liturgy. But of course, as we progress into the current changes of the world and whatsoever, liturgy remains the same. It remains still the focal point of our celebration of union with God and with each other. Again, diversity does not damage unity because I think this was a question that was asked before. What if we have like, you know, Chinese ornaments like in the church? Well, in fact, that's, that's a picture right there of a church with oranges as their ornament celebrating Chinese New Year, right? As long as it is not against, okay, it is not damaging uh, towards the sacramental signs, towards the um, ancestral customs of the Catholic faith. And it's okay. It's what we call all inculturation uh, that Tante Imelda has also shared before, whereby it is, it is allowed that liturgical celebration uh, can be expressed through the culture of the people living in that area. Uh, but most importantly, the liturgy has to not submit to it, aka kita nggak boleh kayak, oh ini kalau orange-nya ini bagusan ditaruh di tengah sini nih. That, but that, that's where the cross has to be put at. No, <laughs> like we cannot move the cross just for the sake of the oranges. So it's like that, okay? Lastly, but liturgy, liturgy is the perfect prayer and encounter with God and one another. And you can see that um, with the picture there with uh, CFJ's anniversary, I think last year. Yes, 2019, sixth anniversary. So, okay, that's for liturgy, right? Now we'll move on very quickly to the sacraments of Christian initiation. Now this is where we're going to talk about 
baptism and so forth. All right. So the sacraments of Christian initiation, as I mentioned just now, there are three of them. There's a total of seven sacraments, tapi ini tiga dulu yang kita akan touch upon, just like the name itself or the term itself, uh, initiation. Display My display kebalik. Yeah, we're seeing. Presenter view. Yeah, not presenter view, tapi ada next slide. That's okay. Is it still like that? Oh, well, we can live with this. <laughs> no! Oh my gosh, why am I like so all over the place today? Sorry, guys. Let me share screen yang bener, please. Okay. Nah, ini sekarang gini, gini. Okay, hide presenter view dulu. Masih kelihatan? Yep, 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 all good. Okay, All right. So, sacraments of initiation, they lay the foundations of every Christian life. Baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. Okay, we have some people who are entering into the sacrament of baptism, confirmation, and you, well, our CIA is basically all these three. Sacraments of initiation, right? You're initiated into the Catholic family. The faithful are born new by baptism, strengthened by the sacrament of confirmation, and you receive the Eucharist as the food of eternal life. Love of contents will separate between baptism and confirmation. So the sacrament of baptism, uh, the, the, the quote there, vitae spiritualis ianua, which means that the gateway to life in the spirit, that's what it means. It's through baptism that we are freed from sin and we are reborn as sons of God. And we become members of, of Christ, of Christ's body. We're incorporated into the church. Not only um, it's about the belonging, but it's also about the mission that is placed in each and every one of us. We become partakers of Christ's mission here on earth, right? So in Acts 2, verses 38 to 39, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. What is baptism? The word baptize uh, comes from the Greek word baptizin, which means to plunge or to immerse. So that's why we use water. The plunge into the water symbolizes the catechumen's burial into Christ's death. If you're still not familiar with the word catechumen, catechumen is basically the candidate well, people who are in RCIA preparation right now, okay, we, call, we call them catechumen. So there's a picture there of how you're going to be baptized. I don't know if like the whole COVID-19 measure will change that, you know, if they're going to use like a water gun, hopefully not. Um, so from the very day of Pentecost, the church has celebrated and administered holy baptism. St. Peter declares to the crowd, astounded by his preaching in Acts 2, if you remember... Uh, where Peter came up to the public and he preached, you know, he, and then he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your, your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 6 verses 3 to 4, it talks, St. Paul again reiterates the importance of baptism into the newness of life. It's the fact that when you are baptized, number one, you have to repent to be forgiven from your sins. Repentance includes a contrite heart, a sincere heart to actually want to do better in life. And then you have also been born into new life, been born new again, right? It's a very common term that you, you actually hear when people get baptized. Why is, it, why is it called new life precisely? When you're still living in your old same house, you're still, living, you're still using the old same car, you know, and you still have your same parents. The newness of life that it brings is more than that. It's the fact that you have chosen to enter into God's covenant. Right? You enter into God's covenant, leaving the past behind of your, the taint of original sin. The, the, the life back then that you feel you, you don't know what is right and wrong. You don't know what hurts God and what pleases God. You've left all of that in order for you to live a life as a Christian. 
dedicated and committed to Christ, and eventually, hopefully, attaining the eternal life in heaven. Okay. So through the Holy Spirit, the bap baptism is a bath that purifies, justifies, and sanctifies the candidate. Why is baptism necessary? Okay. Um, well, in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, it's, it's stated there, uh, Christ Jesus himself proclaimed to his apostles that he, they have to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And of course, passing on, on his teachings until the very end of age. That is the mission that Christ has bestowed upon us, right? And since Christ died for all, and since all men are in fact called to the one and same destiny, which is divine, we must hold that the Holy Spirit offers to all the possibility of being made partakers in a way known to God of the Pascal mystery. I think this, this, this sentence here from uh, Gaudi et Spessium is, is uh, quite complicated, but it's basically what I said just now, right? It's um, the fact that we are actually uh, the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, through God's grace, we can be baptized, we can turn a new leaf, we can you know, have that possibility of being made partakers of, to, of Christ's Pascal mystery here on earth. Every man who is unaware of the gospel of Christ, but seeks the truth and does the will of God in accordance with his understanding of it, can be saved. We've touched upon this actually during uh, the two sessions ago, whereby we've talked about people who are non-Catholics, right? And then an interesting note here is that uh, for catechumens who die before their baptism, their explicit desire to receive it together with repentance of sins, you know, you really want to repent and you've done good works of charity in your life, it actually assures you of the salvation even though you're not yet receiving the sacrament. And then we have the grace of baptism. There's two principal effects of baptism, which is why um, if you see from the verse just now, I actually highlighted and bolded them in red. Number one, the principal effect of baptism is the forgiveness of sins. When you're baptized, all of your sins are forgiven. Your original sin, your personal sin, and, and as well as the temporal punishment for sin. Remember, we talked about the temporal consequences last time, which is why uh, if, you, if you guys can recall last session, we talked to Father Kenny and he actually mentioned if for people to be in a state of grace and to immediately enter into heaven, well, the, the, the best way to do it is you get baptized and then you die, right? Before you can make any more sins. But obviously that's not happening, okay? Because first and foremost, if you're storing your baptism for that, then the intention itself is wrong and God's not, God, God knows, okay? God knows. Um, and it's hard because like from, your, from the point you're baptized and then maybe like a day or two after, whereby you kaya suntak sedikit towards your parents, idea again, you're already like collecting the bad habits or collecting the bad sins, right? The second principal effect of baptism, a new creature, you're born new. You're, you've been adopted as a child of God. You, you're made partaker of his divine nature. You become the member of the church and blah, 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 blah. You, the, all these things that we've talked about before. So baptism indeed is the seal of eternal life. It's a seal whereby we call it as inedible. Once you have received that seal, it's, it, cannot be, it cannot be broken. However, us as Christians, we have to be faithful. We have to, even though we have the seal, it doesn't mean that when we're baptized, we're immediately made into saints because it does not erase you of your inclination to sin. It does not erase you of your human weaknesses. Okay? So, Baptism is not like immediately your life's going to get better. Your life's going to, I mean, no, no, no. Your life's going to be like really easy. You're not going to sin and things like that. Nope, that's not the case. So remember that. How is the sacrament of baptism celebrated? Uh, there's the sign of the cross. There's the proclamation of, uh, of the word of God. And then there's baptismal water, right? And then we have the prayer of the epiclesis, whereby we invoke the Holy Spirit to come upon to baptize the candidates, the catechumens. We have something called the baptism rites. Um, I don't think I have enough time. Maybe I'll go through it after all this is done, yeah. Uh, but basically, when you're baptized, you're baptized in the Trinitarian love. You're baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, okay? 
And then you're also uh, given, uh, you're anointed with sacred chrism. You're given a white garment, a beautiful white garment, which is why you see at the back there, there's people in white. Those are the catechumens. If you're going to be baptized, that's attire that usually you have to wear, the uniform. And then there's a candle as well. As well. Remember the verse that says that we have to be a salt and light of the world and so on. Who can receive baptism? Well, every person who is not baptized can be baptized. Okay. Baptism of adults, we have, um, we have our CIA exactly for that. The faith, is, the faith required for baptism is not a perfect and mature faith. Now, this is interesting because oftentimes, ideally, of course, what we want to ask for is perfect and mature faith. But to be very frank with you, um, it's a journey. Okay. Faith is a journey. Remember that, right? So encountering God, like preserving the relationship that you have with God is, is a lifelong journey. You may fall, you may rise, you can fall again and you get back up again. And that's just, that's just how um, mankind usually is. And we evidently see this from our sins as well. Okay. Our early church fathers, the apostles and so forth. But the faith, the kind of faith that is required for baptism is the beginning of what is yet to come, you know, like, so there's, there's already that seed that's planted in your hearts, which is why actually in the baptismal rites, the priest will ask you, our CIA candidates, what do you ask of God's church? And your response is faith. So you see that when you're baptized, you're not asked to be perfect and mature already. Nobody is, <laughs> okay, as much as we want to. But we have to have the heart that's going towards it. That's already the vision for us after we're baptized is to have that perfect and mature faith. We will never stop learning. Okay, and we'll never, I, I know for sure I will never stop learning until like I die. So who can receive baptism? Checklist. This is something that Hardy is gonna discuss with you guys, RCI candidates. This is just a sneak peek. Usually uh, you have to go through the preparation classes, which are some of you are going through today and no, not today, since April. And then after that, you have an application form and they will ask you of several, several documents. You can read this in your own time. RCI candidates, don't worry, we'll remind you again in a group chat. Who can baptize? Well, who can baptize are the ordinary ministers of baptism are the bishop, the priest, and the deacon, right? In case, however, there's an emergency and there's someone who wants to be baptized, but this person's going to die because of a gunshot wound or I don't know, like think of all the dramatic scenes in your head, okay? The will to do what the church does when she baptizes. So it means that if the, any person, even someone who is not baptized, can baptize if they have the correct intentions to do so and they can apply the Trinitarian baptismal formula. What is the Trinitarian baptismal formula? I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So this is actually in emergency special conditions. Uh, baptism by immersion or by pouring. So you know some people kaya ditaro di pool or the sea, right? And then we have also yang um, di pour by water. That's actually the picture I showed you just now. But as long as it's done with the Trinitarian formula, us, the Catholic Church, we consider it as valid. Okay. Now, infant baptism. Um, remembering our doctrine, our belief of original sin, we, are, we, are, we understand that we are born with a fallen human nature and or we are tainted with the original sin, right, that needs to be freed, which is why children also need that new birth in baptism to be freed from from that original sin taint, which is why Christian parents will recognize this and they will actually, which is why they will actually put their infant into baptism. And there's a parallel there between the Old Testament or the Jewish ways of rite of circumcision. So the rite of circumcision was required as uh, the form of entering into the covenant of God. That's still the Jewish ways of doing things. But for now, um, with the new covenant, with Christ coming into this world, it's no longer circumcision. It's through baptism of, you know, through the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So there's a parallel there whereby baptism has replaced the old tradition or of, of circumcision. 
There's also been multiple occasions stated in the Bible, actually, whereby an entire household's been baptized. And if that's the case, then even the babies inside those households are baptized. Oregon, another early church father, uh, made a commentary on the verse of uh, Romans 5, verse 9. He said that the church has received the tradition from the apostles to give baptism, even to little children, right? But when it comes to infant baptism, of course, the child's own faith must still be cultivated over time, which is why we actually will move on to the strengthening of your faith, sacrament of confirmation. Actually, <laughs> I use that uh, picture over there as well. Um, this was from 2018. You remember, Hardy? Oh, yeah. It was fun. <laughs> So what is confirmation? Through the sacrament of confirmation, number one, we are more perfectly bound to the church. Number two, we are enriched with special strength by the whole, of the Holy Spirit. You know, we're more strengthened by the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, again, we are more motivated to become true witnesses of Christ. Okay. So if baptism initiates, confirmation strengthens. It's as simple as that. And confirmation is usually offered to teenagers, but of course for adults who are on RCIA, itu kan for rights of initiation of Christian adults. Jadi itu kalian langsung barengan baptism and confirmation. Um, so fourth, and then signs and rites of confirmation. So they use an oil, the chrism oil, whereby uh, it, it's it's actually a sign of abundance and joy. It cleanses and heals. It's been it's been used since olden times, even in Jewish tradition. And by using this anointing oil, uh, the confirmant or the catechumen, confirmant is another word for catechumen, but in a confirmation sacrament context, okay? They receive the mark, the seal of the Holy Spirit. Now, it is God who makes both of us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So that is what what and the confirmation is all about. The fact that you are one, you are anointed, you are again strengthened with, with the seal of ownership of, of Christ, and again you are strengthened by the Holy Spirit's graces upon you. You receive the sacred chrism, um, and then afterwards you have the sign of peace. We'll we'll get to there after. I will show you the PDF later. The effects of confirmation are you receive the spiritual seal, yes. you have uh, you gain the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of right judgment, courage, knowledge, reverence, holy fear. You you remember all these things? They are basically um, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and that is really whereby when you're confirmed, the Holy Spirit's works on you will be more unleashed per se. <laughs> okay, but you still have to guard what you have received, of course, because um. Again, like what we mentioned just now, faith is an eternal journey. And confirmation is given only once, similar to baptism, because it also has an illible, sorry, indelible spiritual mark. Indelible meaning that once it's given, that's it. Again, nothing can take it away, nothing can break it. And once is enough. Who can receive this sacrament of confirmation? Well, every baptized person who is not yet confirmed can receive. Uh, they have to be in a state of grace. State of grace itu jadi biasanya, as usual, uh, especially untuk RCIA juga, kalian will be required to go through sacrament of penance before you enter into baptism and confirmation. The minister of confirmation is usually the bishop. That's the original minister. But the bishops can also put into writing formally. I don't know. I forgot what, what the uh, term is called. So the bishop can actually assign a priest to do it right but there needs to be the uh letter that's specifying that and like the whole process has to be go has to uh, has to be undergone and the confirmation effect is to unite those who receive it more closely to the church to our apostolic origins and to a mission of bearing christ to uh witness to christ so that is it for confirmation and stuff uh, we have sharings today, but before that, I will have to share with you the PDF so that you know how it looks like. So the sacrament of baptism and confirmation, uh, generally, especially in Western countries, European countries, they're only done 
uh, for baptism ya only done during Easter. Tapi di Indonesia uh, Jakarta CFJ we have the uh, we have the blessing and we have the opportunity to actually hold RCIA classes um, you know in different timelines harus <laughs> some harus Easter. And the reason for this is, of course, because we understand that there's a great need of it uh, when it comes to the Catholic youth or the youth nowadays. So it was, uh, the sacraments are, are celebrated in Mass. Okay, so it'll be like a whole Mass. Uh, it's like the Sunday Mass that you see. Plus, there is these rites of baptism and confirmation that you, you will need to go through. We started the acceptance rites. We started the acceptance rites. And the celebrant will ask, what is your name? And the candidates, you guys have to answer your names. And then what do you ask of God's church? Remember, we talked about that. And the candidates will answer, faith. What does faith offer you? Eternal life. And then we go on to the declaration of intent, right? And then you have to have a sponsor. For those of you who want to be baptized and confirmed, you have to have a sponsor. It has to be the same gender with you. And preferably someone who can guide you. Okay, who can guide you spiritually, your godparent or sponsor. Those are interchangeable terms. And then after that, this uh, juga over here, you will be again like the whole rights and everything. Right. And now the celebration. Uh, I think like we'll skip this, but I went fast today. Now, and he pours on water, he pours water. So he pours water. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Remember that Trinitarian formula? The celebrant or the priest will baptize the candidate, pour water over the candidate three times. Okay. So for those of you who will be baptized later, just take note of that. And um, you have to position your head in a certain way so ada air kayak enggak bercucuran. Apalagi kalau cewek pakai makeup, right? And the hair and stuff. Then they will give you the baptismal garment, which is usually white in color. They will give you a Bible and a cross and a lighted candle. This will be prepared uh, between you guys and CFJ, okay, CCD team later. So yeah, and then we have chrism. Chrism uh, is after baptism, right? Confirmation is after that. So over here, they will have again the provision, for the, the profession of faith, the baptismal vows. You have to proclaim your faith again. And then afterwards, yeah, you'll be asked, do you renounce sin? Do you renounce the lure of evil? Do you renounce Satan? And so forth. And obviously, you have to say, we do, we do, we do. The laying of the hands, whereby the celebrant outstretched his hand over the candidates, inviting the congregation, us people who come to witness our families and friends, you know, being confirmed. We also outstretch our hands, like to pray for them, to support them through this journey. And yeah, that is it. Oh, sorry. I think I missed the, uh, I missed the, the, ito, apa? the anointing with chrism. Over here, it's also during this time whereby you will be given uh, the chrism oil. Yeah. So that is it uh, for the explanations of liturgy and sacraments. Now I pass on to uh, Devita to share. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dev. So for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Devita and I was baptized last year. Thanks to Hardy and Cynthia, they were helping me. Uh, I married a Catholic uh, in a Catholic way. Um, so now maybe I'm not going to talk about sacraments because Hardy and Cynthia know that better. Probably I'm just going to share about the journey of my baptism and probably there are a couple of things that you might want to know more before or during the the transition. So at first, actually I've been going to the church for about a year or so before I got baptized. But then uh, I never feel the need at that time. I, I didn't feel the need to make it official in a way. But then, um, I got enlightened after contemplating for so long. I was thinking probably if I really believe in it, probably I should uh, learn more and proceed further. And when I 
joined the RCIA, people start asking me why, why do you want to convert? Why do you finally decide to make it official? At first, because it's it's a very sensitive matter. I, I do not want to offend anyone. Uh, at first, I was like trying to find a politically correct answer. I was just say, well, because it suits me well, because it aligns with my value. But after answering with that, answer for so long I was like I think this is actually the right answer there's to me there's no better answer because if you're talking about this religion is good this religion is bad I don't think that's a wise thing to do but this one Catholic it suits me better and then uh, at first I was discreetly asking around about RCIA class because I don't want to make my fiance at the time have uh, such high hopes. I just want to learn for myself. Like if I if I'm going to convert it's gonna be about me and him him uh, as a lord. But then but then I figured that to find a confident and ask for support is actually a better way to do, at least in my case, because I get to do it right. Not only just learn here and there, just a little bit of this and that, but I, you know, when, when you try to learn something, be it religion, be it math or statistics, um, to have someone as the expert, like in this case, Hardy and Cynthia, tell you what's right and what's not and what's the myth and what's exactly the right thing that is written in the Bible, it's very important. So you will not be misled. So yeah, so that's why I joined the RCIA. So the RCIA class was actually conducted every Saturday. At first, uh, at first it was kind of, I was like, okay, so Saturday and Sunday is the, on, the only days off in my weeks, uh, but I have to learn about it. But as I attend the class more and more, it's actually, Mm, I sort of disappointed when the class is over because I still want to learn more. Okay, la, uh, we're talking about religion. We're talking about him, the Lord that we're going to believe in, uh, the religion that we're going to believe in. Kita pacaran aja kan, we want to get to know uh, the person better, apalagi ini. So that's why I think uh, for the RCIA team, I think you should really take your time, enjoy it, and you know, to learn about the religion, it doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't really have to be in the class, you can also ask around at the church, or when you have your dinner with Harvey or Cynthia, you can always try to find out more about Catholics. And then, if there's anything that I would like to tell you, especially our friends who are about to get baptized soon, you should take time to fall in love with Catholics because no one is forcing you. I hope no one is forcing you to, to convert, to change your religion. So you should really take time because once you fall in love, you could definitely feel um, better in a way because you know that you're closer to him. You know that your faith is growing better and better and just like what Cynthia said it's a lifelong journey uh, I think it's different because like my my husband he was born a Catholic he attend all Catholic school I'm not saying I'm not saying like it's different in a in a bad way but for us because it's a new thing for us it requires you to keep learning to maintain your faith to learn more uh, about it so that you could fall in love more and then after that maybe you can share the lights with others now like for example i i try to do this first friday thing before COVID, and then i try to ask my friend to join me and i feel i feel happy because now i i used to be the one that is track to all the church events but now i'm the one who to sort of tell them how, how happy you can be by involved more in the church events. Okay, Sin. Thank you, Dev. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah, 
So uh, Devita was, uh, yeah, yeah. She last year um, she joined while Mark was was in Paris, right? Um, he was working, and Devita itu kayak sendiri datang <laughs> setiap Saturday, Sunday, and of course Mark if he's there, he would he would accompany her. But yeah, you really it was really admirable to see someone like you. Uh, coming very diligently and actually really devoting yourself to fall in love with, you know, the Catholic faith and, of course, ultimately God. So thank you for that. And as for us who are already Catholics, I hope that we can also find those instances and be enlightened once more how it feels like to fall in love with God. <laughs>